Thank you very much for those, those comments. It, it really indicates that we need action at all levels and many of the Mexican states are, have been really leading the charge on a lot of sustainable action. We're now gonna to switch to our next uh, uh, plenary session uh, that is gonna focus on how we need to drive high quality standards in carbon markets. And I'd like to invite the, uh, the, the panel to come up here on, on stage and we'll get going. This uh, panel will be moderated by Kelly Kazir of the Environmental Defense Fund. I've been uh, privileged to be working with uh, Kelly on a number of international initiatives, including critical questions about what's the role that carbon credits should be playing in, uh, in the voluntary carbon markets. And most appropriate for this next session is how to define quality. So as they're making their way to the stage, just want to give everyone a heads up that uh, after this plenary, we'll have some comments from uh, Governor Ige of Hawaii, and then we'll have a short break and continue on with the program. So Kelly, well, welcome aboard. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can see her. Let me just take a minute to get myself sorted here. I think it used to make sense for podiums to be tilted. So good morning, everyone. Um, thanks and welcome to our session on driving high quality standards in carbon markets. I'm delighted to be able to moderate this panel because we have some of the world's best on this topic. So it's gonna make my job super easy. As we all know, the voluntary carbon market is booming and there are a vast number of different papers and a few, a handful of really key initiatives trying to define high quality. Um, in my role at EDF, I've had the honor of working with many of them and with all of our panelists. So we need guidance on the supply side to make sure that carbon credits generated represent real and meaningful mitigation. And we need work on the demand side and on accounting so that we can be sure that the carbon market provides companies with a legitimate and credible avenue to make immediate progress on their net zero commitments. And that's why the efforts that our panel will talk about today are so important. Companies need broad and trusted advice, not a thousand papers that contradict each other. And we all need real answers on what good looks like in this space. So without further delay, let me introduce our panel. I'm gonna start with Brad Challard. Brad is the Director of Carbon Market Governance and Aviation at WWF. He leads WWF's efforts to ensure that carbon markets operate as an effective tool to, to address the climate crisis. Brad, I'm gonna start with a question for you. You've been closely involved with really most of these <laughs> initiatives and I've been lucky enough to work with you on all of them. Um, looking to improve and clarify high quality standards for carbon markets. Can you tell us about some of these and, and why you think there's so much emphasis on this right now? Yeah. Thanks, Kelly, and uh, thanks uh, to North American Carbon World for the invitation to speak today. Um, yeah, the, I think the reason why these initiatives are, are so important is because they're answering key questions that folks have in the market right now. And, and one is on the demand side. When should you be buying carbon credits and how you should be reporting and um, accounting for them? And, and one of the initiatives uh, that I'll talk about very briefly is SBTI, um, Science-Based Targets Initiative, look, looking at beyond value chain mitigation. So that term beyond value chain mitigation, it's really just started to circulate around the community of, over the past few months. And it comes from the SBTI net zero standard, which was released in uh, October of last year. Um, if we look at the SBTI net zero standard, there's really four parts to it. The first part is that you have to have a science-based target, a near-term science-based target, decarbonization target. The second part is having a long-term decarbonization target, say 
2040 or, or 2050. Um, and then uh, the third part is to neutralize your remaining emissions at the point you uh, reach net zero state um, with removals. And then the fourth part is this concept of beyond value chain mitigation, because in the process of transitioning um, to net zero, there will be um, remaining emissions along the way. And what do we do about those? So SBTI is looking to provide additional guidance on that topic um, over this, this coming year. And that project is just at the beginning stages of, of getting started. Um, with regard to the quality of carbon credits, there's a lot of initiatives that are out there. Um, um, I'll talk about one initiative, which is hoping to increase the quality of credits out in the market, and that's the Carbon Credit Quality Initiative. This is a, a project that was started in 2019 by WWF, EDF, and OCO Institute. And what the initiative has done is uh, we've built a 200 plus page assessment methodology that is assessing credits out in the market. It's um, uh, operational, uh, it will um, assess uh, project type, methodology, uh, country and crediting program combinations. It will release its first results um, probably by the beginning of May here. Um, and we're assessing uh, four programs, uh, three project types, eight methodologies in, in 10 countries in this first, first tranche. The reason why we started this project is that um, we know buyers still, even after decades of work on carbon markets and, and the existing carbon crediting standards being out there and, and, and pushing for continuous improvement, we still see buyers wondering um, what a good credit is. And so uh, we thought that we really did need this, this project to um, help buyers understand quality out in the market and be a tool for um, due diligence that they're, that they're gonna have to do in the market. Um, and then the third initiative I'll touch on uh, is answers the question of what you, should you say um, about your um, when, when you buy carbon credits. So the terms carbon neutral, net zero, they're they're often attacked by by a lot of stakeholders out in the market. Um, and so uh, the VCMI or Voluntary Carbon um, Market Integrity Initiative is trying to build claims guidance for companies. Um, so we have a better understanding as a community what a quality uh, claim is. And um, this guidance, initial guidance, is, is going to be released, it seems, at the beginning of June. Um, so just to help you understand the timeline with that. Yeah. Back to you, Kelly. Thanks, Brad. So our goal is to introduce a, a ton of new letters for all of you guys to have to memorize to just add to the already existing alphabet soup. So we have ICVCM, VCMI, CCQI, and BVCM, and SBTI. Just if you can keep that straight, there's gonna be a quiz on your way out the door. Um, next, we have Annette Nazareth. Um, Annette is joining us remotely because she's right now um, in Cambridge. Is that right, Annette? And that is a <laughs> two terms in Cambridge, England. I happen to be back in the States for a school break. <laughs> oh, excellent. And that is a former commissioner at the SEC in the United States. And she's currently the chair of the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets. Um, that's the governance body that was launched on the back of the Mark Carney conceived task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets. Um, Annette, at least three of your board members are here, <laughs> two on this panel. <laughs> so we're delighted to have you with us today. Um, can you tell us a bit about the work of the Integrity Council? Um, well, I could, I could and talk let us know why the initiative is so important. Yes. Uh, so I don't I don't want to dominate. So you tell me how much time I have and I could I could go on forever because it's a very exciting topic. But um uh, yes, as you know, and Alexia knows, and I'm sure some of your, uh, your uh, audience has been involved in our efforts as well, um, uh, you know, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market um, is focused on just that, integrity uh, in, in two areas on, the, um, on the, the supply side of the market and also on, on the market infrastructure side, which I'll describe in more detail. But um, you know, let me start by emphasizing, and I'm sure you've had lots of folks talk about this today, that um, the urgency 
behind our integrity imperative cannot be overstated. Um, we know the IPCC told us last year that any further delay in concerted uh, global action will miss the brief rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. So in the Integrity Council, we take the view that we really need to ensure that every tool available to us in the toolbox essentially is working as effectively as possible to reduce and um, remove greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, uh, we learned just last week that the IPCC also told us that carbon removal technology and nature have a much bigger role to play than we might have previously thought. So nature is one of the cost-effective solutions in the fight against the climate crisis. Uh, it seems to be one of the most under-invested solutions available to us, but also we, uh, we know that the potential for carbon removal technologies is also uh, growing significantly. So um, this is where we think that the voluntary carbon markets can play a very important role. And as you said, um, Kelly, you know, our starting point is that building high integrity into the voluntary carbon market has to be the first priority. Um, and our view is that when we do that, scale of the markets will follow. Uh, this integrity uh, first approach is the foundation of our work at the Integrity Council. And uh, I do look forward to telling you a bit more about that. Um, so as to our mission and mandate, um, as you said, we, we are sort of, we grew out of the task force on scaling the voluntary carbon markets and very much appreciate the foundation that they laid for us. Um, the Integrity Council was established uh, in September of last year. And it's, uh, it was um, with, with the independent governance body for the voluntary carbon market. Um, our purpose is to ensure that the voluntary carbon market accelerates um, a just transition to 1.5 degrees. And we are doing this by setting and enforcing definitive global threshold standards, drawing on the best science and expertise that we believe is available. Uh, and we're doing that so that high quality carbon credits um, channel finance towards genuine and additional greenhouse gas reductions and removals that go beyond what could otherwise uh, be achieved and that would, will contribute to uh, climate resilient development. So uh, I'll end and then you can tell me how much more you want me to go into and we can divide this up. But our mandate covers three areas. Um, first is to establish um, new definitive standards as I said, for high quality carbon credits. Uh, they're known as the core carbon principles. And together with that, we're going to build an assessment framework, which I can describe in more detail later. Uh, secondly, we're going to provide governance and oversight of how carbon crediting programs are applying this expertise, as well as on the market infrastructure and participant, participant eligibility. And then third, obviously, there, as, uh, as Brad said, there are a lot of uh, people involved in this area. There's a real constellation of players across the voluntary carbon markets, and we're going to want to continue to build our links with those organizations and uh, continue to drive improvement in the market. Should I stop there? Yeah, and we can. I think we can pick up more detail and questions. Thank you so much, Annette. Good. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Alexia Kelly. Alexia is currently the director of Net Zero Plus Nature at Netflix. And she's been involved in carbon markets for many years. I've known her for many of those, <laughs> um, including as the U.S. lead negotiator on carbon markets for the Paris Agreement. She also represents the High Tide Foundation on the board of the Integrity Council in her personal capacity, representing Dee and Richard Lawrence, High Tide Foundation's founders. Alexia, you're working closely with, I think, pretty much all of the initiatives that we've just mentioned but you also have an important company perspective. So what in your view are the main challenges companies are facing in trying to deliver on climate action and what from your perspective do these efforts really need to deliver? 
Thanks, Kelly, and good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be back here in person, uh, seeing old friends and getting an opportunity to connect face to face. So thanks for convening the, this conference and um, Kelly, as always, for your wonderful leadership. Uh, so great to meet you all. And I am have the very interesting job of trying to figure out how we can quickly decarbonize a company and make significant contributions to solving the climate crisis. So Netflix uh, is pretty late to the sustainability game. We didn't even have a formal sustainability officer program prior to 19, 2019. So we've been joking that we're trying to make up for our tardy entry with speed and ambition. Um, so last year, we announced our two climate targets. Uh, the first is a science-based target target to reduce our scope one and two emissions 45% below 2019 base year by 2030. Uh, and of course, our scope one and two emissions are fuel that we combust uh, and electricity that we consume. Uh, and we also set a net zero plus nature goal. And that means that we are doing everything we can to fully mitigate the impact of our operations as a global company uh, through investment in high quality carbon credits and nature-based solutions more broadly. So over the course of the last year, we just released our ESG report last week and uh, included a variety of internal measures that we're taking to reduce our emissions. So we were able to deliver about 14,000 tons of reductions from our operations, which are primarily actually making movies, physical production of content. Uh, and we were also able to make significant progress towards our goal of achieving net zero plus nature uh, across our operations. So we retired about 1.5 million tons of carbon credits last year as well. Quality is incredibly important. And as a buyer, you know, we wanna be sure that every dollar we're spending and every additional um, effort that we're undertaking is truly additional and is truly contributing to solving the global climate crisis. And in the market today, that can be really challenging. Um, companies often have pretty limited opportunities to decarbonize our operations. I can't wave a magic wand and eliminate fossil fuels from our operations uh, tomorrow. We are working very hard on doing everything we can to advance vehicle electrification, to deploy clean and silent uh, options for mobile generation. We use a lot of diesel generators uh, in the physical production of movies. So we're spending a lot of time looking at new technologies, including green hydrogen fuel cells and other mobile battery technologies that can help us get those operational emissions um, out of our day-to-day -day operations as a company. But it's very slow. It's going to take time. Um, and so investment in high-quality offsets enables us to really move beyond um, what we would be able to deliver if we were only focusing within the bounds of our company walls and contributing to the preservation, restoration, and conservation of critical ecosystems globally in a way that delivers real and very important benefit to frontline communities, um, advances climate resilience, protects water quality, uh, and, and really drives the sustainable livelihoods that we know are so important for frontline communities globally who are grappling with the impacts of, of accelerated climate change. Change. So the work that, that companies do, I think, broadly as we're navigating this space is um, complex. It's multifaceted. There is a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on companies and a lot of scrutiny, quite rightly, um, to ensure that what we're doing is additive, is additional, and really does make a difference. Um, but the work of all of the, the alphabet soup that Kelly was talking about um, is really critically important because in order to mobilize financing and investment at scale, companies need to understand what the rules of the road are. We need to know what's expected and we also need to be able to go to the market and with a high degree of assurance, know that what we're buying has high integrity and is delivering those environmental outcomes we care so much about. So as we move forward as a, a community, I think really staying laser focused on ensuring that we are delivering those environmental outcomes uh, and also really advancing our collective and shared goals around addressing climate change and leveraging markets to unleash the incredible innovation and impact that we know that they can deliver, I think is our shared challenge. So thanks and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you all. Um, we are gonna open the floor to questions now. Um, so any questions, we're, all four of us are very closely involved with these um, big initiatives. So we'd be happy to answer, any of us could probably answer a lot of the questions. We may not even agree with each other, which would be fun for you to watch. Um, <laughs> 
But I'd also like to put a question to you. What do you want to see these initiatives deliver? We'd love to hear back from you because we're right in the middle of developing all of this now. Please. Thank you. This is a great panel and, and I'm listening very carefully to what you're all saying. Um, it's great to see these um, emerging guidelines and standards to define integrity and quality and claims and credits. And, and, and we need it and we're sort of going through our second Wild West phase. In California, the first Wild West phase was when CCAR, the predecessor to CAR, was first created and that led to where we are now. So now we're seeing this new emergence of the voluntary market. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm glad to see you know, these various bodies emerging, but I wanna ask the flip side question. And that is, what mechanism do we have for calling out bogus credits? I see a real reluctance in parties of all sides unwilling to criticize their fellow um, body of whatever it is. But I also see some really, um, to me, offensive standards coming or products coming out that are being promoted that don't meet the basic tests of honesty to the atmosphere. So I don't, other than just writing your random op-ed and you know railing, um, is there any way to uh, formalize, not, maybe not formalize, but somehow regularize the um, calling out of credits that um, don't um, provide, they're, they're dodgy, they don't provide transparency. How can we identify those so that buyers who are looking for high quality credits will be alerted? I think that's a great question. Does anyone want to go first? Annette? I'm happy to do it, sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, I totally agree with um, with your sentiment and your concern. And it is something that we have spent a good deal of time talking about in the Integrity Council. Um, you know, the, the hope is that by building, uh, you know, global standards that become accepted, uh, it, will, it will make trading in these carbon uh, credits much easier. Um, you won't need, uh, you know, departments of experts uh, in, in order to determine whether a credit is uh, additional and valid and permanent and all the, has all the attributes that, um, that we support. Um, you know, as you know and, and imply from your question, in the voluntary carbon market, we don't have regulatory authority. Um, you know, I'm a former commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and it's sort of nice to have that authority, I must say, because you can, you can enforce, you can bring, you know, the uh, uh, all sorts of sanctions uh, against people who don't follow certain standards. We don't have that, but we do, and we do have some tools and we are focused on, on using them. One is what we call name and shame, which is similar to what you were talking about. Can't we call these people out? I think in the Integrity Council, we intend to call people out uh, when we think that what they're trading bears no resemblance to the quality that we are supporting in our CCPs. The other is that um, you know we're also gonna be sort of approving um, the carbon crediting programs and to the extent that they are not, their, their programs are not following the CCPs, we, we would have a number of, um, tools, including the ability to sort of deauthorize them and, and to not recognize them anymore as a valid um, crediting program. Uh, so it is our intention to do as much as we can without government authority to, uh, to call out, uh, to sanction, to do whatever we can, because uh, we think this market is so critical to contributing to, um, you know, to, to getting to the 1.5 degree goals. And if the market is not respected, if it doesn't have integrity, um, it's really going to uh, damage our ability to make, to make meaningful progress. And we care deeply about, about uh, having meaningful progress and integrity in these markets. 
So thanks for the question. Thanks, Matt. Does anyone else want to pick up on that, Brad? Yeah, um, I, th I think right now, um, and for years, we have had actors and uh, NGOs that have gone after individual projects, right, that are calling out bad practices. I think that, um, and I would not necessarily put WWF always in that, on that side, we tend to be a little bit more in the middle um, centrist, right? And so that's with the Carbon Credit Quality Initiative, it's it's more an objective tool. We're trying to make it an objective tool so you can simultaneously see the things that are not good in the market, but you can also see things that are good, right? Um, I think that the standardization and understanding of the good and the bad and, and the gradation of good and bad, which is another thing that Carbon Credit Quality Initiative is trying to do, we're trying to rate on a scale, not just a, are you good or bad, but but um, you know, we have a one through five scoring system, right? So you can see how you can move up through the ranks and, and every person or excuse me, um, uh, entity within the carbon credit development uh, value chain can see how they can improve. Um, but at the same time, I think that that will probably enable some of the actors that might be more interested in going after bad practices to do that in a more um, systematic way uh, or maybe not a systematic way, but but using um, like a, a, a better rating system, right? To, to do that in, a, in that it's not arbitrary. I think what we see a lot of the time is sort of arbitrary attacks, right? Um, so hopefully these tools that are coming out into the market can, can help, um, you know, just uh, expose the good and the bad, right? And Alexia, I, I might turn it a little bit for you because you've, you've been out in the world trying to buy and, trying to navigate this sometimes, you know, murky landscape, and you are a carbon market expert. So many trying to navigate that landscape are not. So maybe your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And thanks for the <laughs> question. I think it's a really important one. You know, we screened, I think, over 100 million tons of projects last year um, from across the market, mostly in the nature-based system, but also uh, methane mitigation, which of course the IPCC has noted as a critically important part of stabilizing the climate. And um, that process was really educational for me. Um, and I think the, the lack of transparency that, that Brad is talking about is a key contributor to really making it difficult for buyers to navigate the market. So if you're really interested in understanding what's happening with a given project, you know, you're digging through 200 plus pages of project design documents and trying to like really understand what was the underlying assumptions that went into the methodology that the credit was issued against and you know which version of the methodology you're using and and so that level of detail is obviously not reasonable for most buyers to be undertaking. Um, and we it's one of the reasons why the work of the ICVCM is so incredibly important right now, because figuring out how we set that minimum bar, building on you know, the very good work that the standards have been doing in this space over the last 20 years, um, and recognizing that, that there is no state of perfection for the carbon market. It's always going to be Iterative, it's always going to be evolving as policies evolve, as um, our understanding of the science continues to evolve. And so really recognizing that, that we're going to have, you know, the steady state of the carbon market is always going to involve some amount of fluidity and that that's okay. I think is a core part of what we're really trying to understand, but simplifying access to information, making it easier to understand what's under the hood of a given offset project, um, and also really thinking about the, you know, the additional stamp that we're looking to, to put on credits in the market so that folks can easily say, yep, we, we know that we've really dug into this and we can say with a, a high degree of assurance that um, these particular projects are in fact delivering the climate outcomes uh, that, that are required. So that is, is in no means intended to cast aspersion on the incredibly good work of the standards, but there's a lot of volume moving through the market right now. And so we need to continue to, to support the entire infrastructure around accelerating quality so that we can work together to really deliver the outcomes that, that everyone in this market is seeking to deliver, I think at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, oh, sorry, please. I was going to say, I think those are excellent points, and I want to sort of echo uh, some of what Alexia said in the sense that it's not, we're doing two things, right? We're, we're standardizing the product, right? The, the offset, the quality of the offset, but also 
as you mentioned, by focusing on the markets. I mean, if, if this is really going to scale up to the levels that we think are necessary and achievable to really contribute to meaningful decarbonization, then having those products trade in transparent markets that have high integrity is also key because the, the thought of being able to achieve the scale that is possible, but to do bilaterally is just not, it's not efficient. And if we can have efficient markets, transparent markets, registries that, you know, that basically keep track of all of this, you know, it's, um, it's a whole different uh, structure from what we have today. And we think that's all very achievable, but it is our singular focus now to get, get to that point. I was just going to add, I'm abusing my moderator position to answer the question, but um, I think a lot of quality starts with transparency. It has in basically every carbon market we've seen, both compliance and voluntary, and we need more transparency on what's being used for what in what circumstance. Um, and that's not there right now, but we're seeing emerging guidance, both voluntary guidance and some regulation and government guidance emerging on that. So it's gonna improve it a lot. <clears throat> and just to double down on what Annette was saying, I think, I, I am sure there are companies that are focused on dodgy credits, I guess. But what we actually see mostly is companies really confused about what it is they should be buying. And then they're hiring in resource sort of individually. That's not efficient. We should get the carbon market experts together have them create clear guidance on what good looks like, and then companies can rely on that. And then through transparent reporting of what they used and how and when, we can all be watchdogs. And I think those, those are the key pieces that are currently missing. Are there other questions? I'm sorry, we've got kind of stage lights on us, so I can't see, but I know there's someone looking. Cheers, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, thank you to the speakers for facilitating this fantastic session. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about corporate communication. Much of the discussion has been regarding ambition and, and how to sort of improve transparency and communication. Um, but you know, at the moment, we see a lot of ambivalence from end buyers um, who don't want to engage in the market for fear of being criticized or called out for greenwashing. <laughs> Um, and much of that is, is around the lack of transparency and it's a vicious cycle, chicken and egg. So I, my question is about what corporates can do right now um, in terms of communication. If I'm a corporate and I want to engage with the carbon market and I'm doing good work and employing great people to do the job of acquiring what I perceive to be high quality credits, to then communicate that out to the market and the stakeholders that care, becomes quite tricky. You know, everyone in this room has an idea of what quality means. That's not the case for the wider world. Um, so I guess my question is, for a corporate looking to engage with the market today and not wait for improved transparency, how does one engage with or develop some sort of comms or marketing strategy to, in a simple way, reassure stakeholders that the credits they're engaging with are, in fact, legitimate, additional, and of high quality? That is such a good question. <laughs> it is a really good Alexa, question. Yeah, I you think, start? <laughs> yeah I, our, so our approach on this has, has been transparency, humility, and I think doing the work. So talking very openly about both our challenges we face in decarbonizing our operations. So we know that leading with internal action and reductions is you know, our first priority. Um, but recognizing that that as I noted before, you know, fossil fuels touch every part of our business and they touch every part of any business that does anything in the real world. So it's going to take us some time to make the systems level transformation that needs to happen as we, we transition to a net zero economy over the next two decades. Um, so I think the way that we have structured our communications around this is really a yes and. Um, it is a, yes, we're doing the hard work of internal decarbonization, acknowledging that it's going to take some time. Um, if for us, you know, our emissions increased last year, we're a rapidly growing business that operates in a lot of countries. And so we have an absolute emission reduction target in 2030, and we're on track to hit that. 
But communicating those types of nuances is really challenging <laughs> when you're talking to the general public and folks are really just looking for the headline. So the, the engagement with the carbon market, um, we, you know, we talk about our five-step screening process. We talk about the extensive due diligence that we do. We talk about the grounding in the science as you know, looking to nature-based solutions and carbon markets as a mechanism for delivering verified, quantified, you know, independently third-party verified and quantified emission reduction outcomes. Um, those are all really important aspects for us of making sure that we are spending our money in the best ways to help solve this problem. So that I think, and, and really structuring our portfolio around where the science tells us is most important. So, you know, really looking at conservation of existing tropical and other forests, as well as supporting ecosystem restoration uh, and methane mitigation, as I mentioned before. Um, but every company is going to have a slightly different approach to how they, they talk about these things. Um, and it is, it is, I can say, you know, incredibly challenging. Um, we lose a fair bit of sleep over making sure that we're saying things in the right way so that people really understand that, you know, we are, with all sincerity, doing our best to make a, a real contribution to this problem. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo a lot of what Alexia said. I think that, um, you know, there's, there's not, one of the things that the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative is trying to do is provide a systematized way to understand how to make good claims, right? But I think in the meantime, if um, companies are looking to develop communication strategies to make sure that you're expressing humility, making sure that you're communicating authentically, right? Because I think a lot of the, the backlash um, to, to claims in the space is that they seem unctuous, right? They seem slimy to certain stakeholders. So thinking about how you're communicating with your consumers and how perceiving how other stakeholders are going to interpret that is, is a key thing. And just being authentic and honest and transparent, I think will will go a long way. So I know a lot of a lot of questions that companies will get from the CEO, like, okay, so can I claim carbon neutrality here? They they kind of want that that headline claim. Um, I think um, you know what I tend to advise companies is to to try to build in a narrative, right, and a story as well, and not just rely on that headline claim in, in the marketing. Um, it it I think it goes a long way with with consumers um, to be authentic. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. Annette, did you want to? Well, I just, you know, it, it's such a good question, and I don't have the answer to, uh, you know, any better answer than the good ones I've heard on what to do today. I, I think what I would say is help is on the way, right? I mean, uh, the problem we have now is that you've got very well-meaning corporations that, you know, there's a, a friction now, a resistance in some cases to engaging in the voluntary carbon market because, of the fear of, of you know, not buying a, a credit that is viewed as good enough, or, you know, in some way, you know, not meeting really their fiduciary duties by engaging in, in activities that are, you know, for the betterment of the company. Whereas, you know, going forward, what we're what we're trying to do is really address what are the three pillars of the market, right? The the supply side, making sure that we have high quality carbon credits. That, uh, that meet certain threshold standards. Secondly, that they trade in markets that have high integrity and are transparent and where you can have efficient pricing. And thirdly, and going to Brad's point, you know, that the credits that they're, they're taking, you know, using the credits in ways that are also universally accepted. And that's obviously what, you know, VCMI is doing and, and is so important as well. So I think if we address these three pillars and we're optimistic because I think between the Integrity Council and VCMI, I think we're, we're working a pace to address these issues. I, I'd like to think that some help is on the way. What, what you do in the meantime, I leave to others. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've got my communications director in the front row and this is a constant frustration. Yeah. The level of detail required, the level of nuance required to really determine high quality is, is not very digestible. The general population. Um, but I think these initiatives we're talking about, they're developing labels and, and really clear, simple, two word. I mean, there's a reason net zero resonated, right? Because it's easy to understand, it's two words. Um, so what we need are like, you know, the rock star level one kind of a label so that, so that it's really clear where companies land in a way that's 
you know, you can tell your parents at dinner, which no one in my family knows what I do. <laughs> um, and I think we're working on it. We know that. And, and I think those simple, clear labels will help. Are there more questions? Maybe we'll take two this time because I think we're getting a little bit short. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I certainly like the way you, uh, you framed it, uh, labeling. I think that, that really is the right way to look at it. Uh, Arthur Lee, again, with Chevron and also an AIDA council member. Uh, I, I really have a, more of an observation. I'd like you to react to, to it. Uh, it seems like there is a business opportunity here for, um, for companies to actually like verifiers or somebody to summarize this whole constellation, I think that's the word that Annette used, constellation or plethora of all these initiatives out there. Uh, so there seems to be a consultancy opportunity for people to actually summarize all of these and assess a company's uh, 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 demand for credits and looking at whether those credits that they are uh, looking at have any value. Uh, so anyway, it's, 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 a, it's an issue for, I think Netflix and certainly an issue possibly for for us at Chevron as well. So I'd like to get get your reaction to that opportunity for consultants. Yeah, I and, and I think there's probably some consultants in the audience who just heard you. I'll just take another question so we can take them both at once. Oh, there's a few in the back. Um, in this middle aisle and then. Hey, thank you. Um, my question is, so Alexia, you mentioned kind of the importance of methane mitigation here. And I think there's sort of a challenge in carbon markets of equating methane and other non-carbon greenhouse gases to carbon and going to a CO2 equivalent metric. And there's kind of some, I mean, these gases are just fundamentally different. <laughs> and so I know there's been a lot of debate about that the past couple of years. But I guess I'm, I'm curious how you think about that. Do you see these different gases as being totally different, you know, parts of the portfolio where you can't do substitution between them? You can't replace methane mitigation with carbon reduction? Um, or is this something that you see there is going to be kind of one standard, one fully accepted way to convert between the two? Um, because I think that pricing is, you know, we, currently there's the 28X equivalent, but I think there's a lot of debate about whether that's the right place to land. Um, and so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, sorry, oh, sorry, I'll just take ahead. the last question Let's in the back and then we'll do, the it as a, we'll do it as a... Yeah, thank you everyone for your time on this panel. I really enjoyed hearing it. So I am uh, Adit, uh, CEO of Boomitra, and we are scaling carbon removal credits. It's nice to finally see you, uh, Alexia, actually. So uh, we, uh, uh, my question is actually related to that. Uh, how do you see the interplay between uh, carbon removal and carbon avoidance when it comes to the carbon markets and quality now? Especially there's many companies who are thinking a lot about carbon removals as opposed to carbon avoidance, and there's some that do both. And there's all sorts of things. And even SBTI is trying to push people towards a certain direction. So I'd like to hear all of your takes on that. So three questions, the role for consultancy or intermediaries, I, I guess more broadly, but consultancy specifically, um, the removal res reduction question and the short-lived climate pollutant uh, fungibility question. Um, any, any takers for any? Yeah. I can kick us off. Um, so yeah, absolutely, are there on the consultancies. I think we, it, we lost kind of a decade of professional development in the last crash. So a lot of people left the market um, it's, and went to do other things, um, including myself and a whole bunch of other folks. So it's great to see people coming back in, but I think really looking at opportunities to bring in you know, a, a much larger number of people who are professionalized in greenhouse gas accounting and carbon markets generally is incredibly important. Um, and as anybody who's been trying to hire lately, you know, there is a real ESG um, gap in the market in terms of uh, talent. So continuing to invest in that, I think just more broadly is, is incredibly important. 
Um, on the methane fungibility question, you know, the markets, the, the existing crediting standards handle this just by following the IPCC guidance and conversions. I think that's the right answer. Um, I get, I start to get really nervous when we get too complicated in parsing, oh, this type of emissions from this source gets matched by this other thing over here that it's the, the, the deeper we go and the more complex we make this, the less accessible it is to companies and the harder it is for them to understand what right looks like. So I think as we're developing all of these standards, one of the things we've really been trying to emphasize is the need for simplicity and accessibility um, because not every company can afford a fully staffed CSO office with multiple people. So really working towards how do we, how do we make this type of ambition and market access broadly available is, is incredibly important. Um, and then the avoidance removal question. So Netflix has been very clear about this in all of our public communications. The science is unequivocal. We need both. We have to preserve existing carbon stocks and existing carbon stocks house uh, some of our most cost-effective abatement globally. So ensuring that we don't lose the critical ecosystems that we have now uh, is certainly at the top of our list. And I think has, has been very, very clearly uh, indicated by global scientific consensus as a high priority for the next decade. In addition, uh, you know, and I think the IPCC report that came out this week really underscores this as well. You know, we do need an all of the above strategy. We need removal, we need avoidance, like we need it all. Uh, and so uh, coming again to simplicity and accessibility, uh, we think it's important that companies get that signal for investing in high quality credits, regardless of whether they're, you know, conservation of existing carbon stocks, removals, methane mitigation, high GWP gas destruction, those should all be priorities and included in corporate strategies. And I think the more flexibility we can give companies to go out and find the highest quality abatement that's available globally that makes a, a contribution to this challenge, the better. Brad or Annette, do you want to come in on any of those yeah. questions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess on the the question of consultants and capacity, um, yeah, it's it, there, there. There is a big gap right now. I I think as well the, the the initiatives that are coming out, it does seem like an alphabet soup. There is sort of an overlapping nature sometimes to the different initiatives. I, I think it is in some part the initiatives' um, responsibility to try to communicate how they differentiate and to stay in contact with one another. And there's some of that, that that's definitely happening. But I think that will help um, the consultants too to understand how to um, interpret this for for clients, right? Um, and then I guess on the uh, sort of removal versus avoided emissions um, topic. I think that in the market, it, it will be great when we are able to tag, you know, if something is a removal and uh, avoided emission, I think that some of that is happening right now um, to, to help buyers um, understand what's what's what. Um, I think on the on the SBTI, there, I think a comment about how SBTI is sort of directing companies towards removals. I know that there's that that interpretation out there but it's actually not representative of what is coming out on from SBTI. If you look at um, an FAQ on beyond value chain mitigation that was published alongside the net zero standard, that um, goes into more detail um, and it explains that it is important to invest in the near term in reductions in things like jurisdictional red um, before you get to the net zero state, right? There's an acknowledgement that there needs to be this transition, but that doesn't mean the transition needs to happen immediately and that everyone needs to shift towards removals now, right? So um, just wanna make sure that, that, that there's that clarity. And if you haven't looked at the beyond value chain mitigation <coughs> FAQ um, in the SBTI net zero standard, I would recommend doing that. Thanks, Brad. Annette? Yeah, just a few things. Uh, I certainly agree uh, with Alexia that you know a lot of people sort of went out of the consulting business and, and didn't focus on uh, you know on climate issues because there was not enough progress being made and and jobs available. Uh, so obviously that's something that would be very helpful. Uh, but again, as I said before, what is also going to be helpful is to standardize uh, to the extent possible uh, how trading can occur. Uh, on uh, for the carbon credits, so that it does not every company does not have to retain a consultant in order to ensure that if they're buying something in the public markets that uh, that it meets certain high quality standards and that they should be 
confident that that's the case. Um, I'm not sure I have much to add on removal versus avoidance, but I will use the question to uh, to emphasize that you know our core carbon principles uh, will be uh, addressing a number of these issues and taking positions on how how these things should be accounted for and um, very much want to uh, encourage everyone to take a look at those when they're issued. We're gonna have a full public consultation process starting uh, in the middle of May. The exact date hasn't um, been determined yet, but we really are interested in all viewpoints in order to you know, ultimately come up with the best set of high quality standards that represent some version of consensus. Obviously you never get 100% consensus that, that you know, this is a very complex area, but we are very interested in, in having a robust comment process and those comments, which will be true, uh, you know, fully transparent, uh, will feed into what become our final CCPs that will be issued in the third quarter. Thank you. And just my two cents, um, using global warming potential over a hundred year scale, means that for short-lived climate pollutants, methane being the most prominent, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, right? That's got a lot of climate benefit because it's being measured over a hundred year scale and it's got sort of a 12 year half-life. So you're getting a lot in, in the one credit. And I think that's the way to look at it, but accounting using CO2 equivalent is the general standard and trying to account in a different way would be a inconsistent with the Paris Agreement and be um, really complicated, but we can think about it where it would be absolutely necessary. I just haven't heard a compelling case to make that so complicated gas for gas yet. Um, and on the removal versus reduction, there are many companies, for instance, that are focused only on removals and I applaud them. That's a policy decision. That's not a decision based on quality. That's a decision based on policy. And There'll be others that are focused on small projects that really benefit local communities or indigenous um, people. That's also a wonderful policy decision. But if everybody, if every company took the same policy decision, <laughs> we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and so I think we need all of the tools in the box, all the crayons in the box, whatever you want. Like <laughs> we waited too long. So now we have to do everything and the bath is full. So we need to pull the plug, but it's, the reality is that the tap is still very much on. So we need to do it all in particular in this decade and probably the next. Any others? We've scared them quiet. Oh, here, thank you. <laughs> Everybody, thank you for the uh, great session so far. Uh, so my name's Trevor Anderson. I work for Edison Energy doing corporate carbon management services. So I am one of those consultants. Uh, one of the, uh, so one of the strategies we support companies with is their carbon offset strategy, looking at long-term uh, types of initiatives. Risk is a big thing that comes into play. And so I'm curious with these types of initiatives you have underway, these tools you're developing outside of the, you know, offset quality criteria like additionality permanents, how do they uh, incorporate risk, like geopolitical risk, jurisdictional, regulatory, things of that nature? Uh, do you wanna, that, that feels like that's right up your alley, Annette. Yeah, um, well, we'll see when we come out with the CCPs, whether that's a, a factor. I mean, obviously, you know, permanence, additionality, the, the traditional, criteria are there. I'm not sure political risk is something that we'll see in the, in the CCPs, but uh, certainly any any uh, criteria that is not uh, in our proposal, folks like yourself could comment on and uh, we could certainly take, you know, take that under advisement. Thank you. Can I just have a time check? Are we um, until 11 or 10 past 11? 11. Well, well, <laughs> let me just thank you very much for being such a great audience and asking such amazing questions. But really, I want to thank this panel. Um, 
of experts, of friends. Thank you. It's been a real joy. Thank you.